Hey developers, interviewing is difficult. If you've ever been in an interview for a web development job, you know it's not always easy. And hopefully you're in an organization that isn't gonna rely on algorithms or whiteboarding, but more on actual general knowledge on JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. In my career, I have gone through several of these type of interviews, so I wanted to show you some common interview questions for front-end web developers that actually got right off of Reddit. There was a thread the other day of some interview questions that this developer got. He was trying to uh, become a front-end web developer. It was JavaScript-related questions. So I'm going to show you my thoughts on these questions. We're gonna go through them and we're gonna answer them. And actually, I'd love for you guys to also go through these questions. So I'm gonna leave a link in the description below to the stack blitz. You can open that up, you can edit it, and you can actually try to do these yourself as we go along and do them together. So I'd really appreciate that. If you that. can, make sure in the comments below, let me know how you, what kind of interview questions you've been getting, you've been getting at the interviews that you've had in the past. Uh, I'd love to hear and just uh, leave a comment below. Hey, and if you don't know, my name is Eric. I'm a full stack software developer. I have several years of software development experience. I'm also a published author. And I'll leave a link below if you guys want to check that out. So let's take a look at the screen here. And so here's the stack blitz. And I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. And if you don't know, stack blitz is just a website where you can put code in and you can get code out at the same time. So right here, I have my stack blitz here. I have uh, this hello world. And then here's just the console that we're going to be using that we're going to write everything in. If you don't know, this is the actual original thread that was just posted on Reddit on slash web dev a couple days ago. And these are the questions that he got in an actual interview. So the first question <coughs> I want to go over is this one. This is this is a great interview question. It's pretty basic, but I think it goes over a lot of things that you should know. And I'm gonna leave this console open here. Don't worry about that error right now. And so we're gonna take a look at it. And the question for this one is, it's asking you what happens when you do let d equals a. So you have this object here. It's nested with this object called b and then this c property, key and value. And so first you're doing this assignment operator where you're taking D equals A. And like I said, make sure you're, if you like, you can follow along. You can click on the link in the stack blitz and you can kind of play around, play around with this. And then the next thing that happens is we're gonna take A and dot B dot C and have it equal five. So it's, this C is gonna equal five. So the question, the first question you should ask yourself is what happens when you output A, B, C? What do you get? So, you know, take a second and think about this. So if you're thinking, you probably should come up with the answer. So we're changing A, we're changing B, and changing C, and we're making equal five. So let's see if it comes out with five. Cool. You can see right here, uh, I can't make this too much bigger, maybe a little bit. This shows five, that's exactly as we expected. So that's good to know. Now, this is a little more trickier. So if we console log d.b.c, so we did the assignment operator, d.b.c, so what should that output? I'll clear it here. So if you guessed five, let's see what happens. So we'll uncomment it out. Cool, so we get five and five. So you would be correct. Now, some of you are saying, well, why isn't it four? Well, essentially what you're doing is when you do D equals A, the, there's a almost like a pointer that refers to this object. So your D is actually is pointing to the same object as A. So when you make a change to A, it actually makes a change to D at the same time. So it's, it's kind of like a reference to actual A. It's unlike if you were just had you know, let B equals one, two, three, and then C equals B, uh, let, let C equals B, and then you change B to, I don't know, you could even do like this, uh, 
b equals 10, c is still going to equal 1, 2, 3. So if we console log c, it's 1, 2, 3. So it didn't change to 10 even though it's referencing b because it's uh, that type of uh, it, it, that type doesn't get changed that way. Oops, let me get rid of all this rest of the stuff. So there's a, there's an idea called pass by reference and pass by value. You guys can look that up if you don't understand the, those concepts. But essentially, um, we're we're just it's not the same object itself. It's almost like we have a pointer and we're just changing the direction of where we're pointing to. And that's how that works. So the second question is how to set up debounce. Now, so this is a really common problem that we have in web development is that we have uh, we have a some sort of input or something that we don't want to trigger every time it changes. So the classic example is you have like a search box right here. And every time you type, you don't want it to trigger in every keystroke, but after a certain period of time. So maybe after every 500 milliseconds, then it goes ahead and publishes it or um, goes ahead and, and does something to it. So that's kind of the idea behind debounce. So as long as you're typing, it's constantly waiting until your end of your typing until at least 500 milliseconds is reached between the last time you type something. So uh, th this is to this is a little bit more advanced, but if you know how to use closures, this can actually be a little bit easier. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, well first let's take a look at and I'm going to comment this out so we don't keep getting more stuff in here. Let's take a look at this input right here, and I'm just going to add an event listener to it. So just real simple, we'll do a document dot query selector, and then we'll just grab input from it, and then I'll just do input dot add event listener. We'll do it on every key up event, and then we'll have a function here. Let's call it e, and then we can do something. So I can just console log e. And if we do that, you could see here, I type something, I have a keyboard event every time I type. But if let's say we wanted this to be part of some kind of drop down search or something that needed to go off and do something after you're done typing it, then we don't want it to do 20 requests in every single time you type a, a number. So this would be a great example, something you may want to use debounce for because it'll wait until you're done typing until it actually sends the request off. So the easiest way to create a debounce, and go ahead and see if you guys can create this by yourself at this point. So this is the way I would do it, and there's certainly different ways to do it, but I would create a debounce right here. And I apologize for the clicking noises. I do have quite a mechanical keyboard that makes a little bit of noise. I am trying to fix that. And um, so First, we're going to have this function. So this is going to be a closure. We're going to pass in a function. It's going to return a function. And it's also going to, we're going to pass in a timer, which is the amount of time it'll take before it actually triggers. And then we're going to do a time ID here, which is going to be outside the inner function, which I'm going to just set it to null. And then we're going to return another function. Um, we're going to use this rest operator, we're gonna return back the args, which is three dots. And then inside here, we're going to create a timeout. But first, we want to, if the timer ID um, exists, we want to clear the timeout, which is this one, with this timer ID. A time ID, that is. Uh, make sure I don't have too many, let me spell it correctly. There we go. And then at every time we want to set the time ID to a set timeout. And uh, that's going to have a function here. And this timeout is going to do something at this point. So we just want it to run the, the function that's passed to it. Arcs, there it is. And that is essentially what we want to do. Oh, we got to pass in the timer too. Timer. So we have one error here. So because I forgot error function. There we go. So this debounce is going to run every time. And remember, this this outer 
variable outside this return function is uh, special because we're using closures. So it's going to remember what this time ID is every time this function is called. So when it, when it gets called, it's going to say, oh, if, is the function, is this set? If it is, clear the timeout and then set the timeout again. So every time you press a button, it's going to go through this loop here. It's going to clear the timeout, which actually doesn't trigger the actual function inside of it, and it's going to set a new timeout until this set timeout, whatever this timer amount, is, is hit. And this is a really simple closure. If you don't know about closures, I think I did a video on it a little while back. Um, it's, it's a little bit more of an intermediate topic, but it's really powerful in JavaScript. So now we can go back to our event listener here. And instead of having the keyboard event every key, keystroke, we can now set this up to use the debounce method. So we called it debounce. So we'll do debounce here. And the first argument of the debounce is the function, which will be this. And the second argument is the timer, which let's say one second. And then inside this debounce here, we can uh, I think that's actually all we want to do. Let's see if this works. Actually, we have one error. I think we need an extra one of these. There we go. So if I start typing, 1001. You can see it only did one event. So if I keep typing and typing and typing, I don't see any events. I stop, I wait for a second, then it triggers. This might actually be more useful. I'll do input.value so you can see what it does. This is a string. This is a string. So you can see it. See, can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. So essentially, I'll make this a little bit smaller. So essentially, every time you type, it's debouncing until you're done typing. It waits that second and then, then show, uh, shows you it. So that's it. That's all you need to do. This is a really simple clear timeout. You could do also other things. I've seen other people have like an immediate, uh, you can actually put like another a parameter here to like immediately go ahead and, and clear it. But uh, that's a little bit more complicated. This is just a really simple example of how to do it. All right. So this is the third interview question that you should know about. Uh, so here's number three. So I have a function here. So you can see here, let a, which gives me an error because cannot read declare block scope a. Let me just comment this out for now. Okay, so we have an a block and it has a length so this is an object, an object expression, I guess, I guess an object. And then it has a length here of five. And then this is a function that console logs this dot length. So the, normally the way this works is this object here, it grabs this dot length. So it, it's within inside this object and it'll grab this, the length of, of this, this one right here. So if we do a, b, and I reset it here. You can see here it returns five, which is what we expected. Length is five. However, what happens if we do this? We do const, here I'll delete this because we did it in a couple different places. So now we're gonna assign the variable r to a, oops, let's do it like this first. Let's say we take the const r and we, have it equal a dot b. Now the question is during the interview is if you run this, you invoke this function because you know a dot b is a function. What will happen? It'll try to grab this dot length. What will happen? Okay, so think about that. Now you might think that it returns five. So let's see what happens. So I'm going to clear this output here. I'm going to clear this one, and I'm going to run this one. So this is weird. It says error cannot read property of undefined. So you're probably wondering, well, why doesn't it run? Why doesn't it work? We're returning the function and it's running this dot length. Why can't it read it of undefined? Well, the thing is, is that we're actually a dot b is just this function by itself. It doesn't have the context of the whole object itself. So we can't actually get the length five out of it. So that's why it fails. Um, 
you could say the same thing if you do it this way. So this is a little different. So um, you saw there, let me show you again. So it actually returned five. Now you're thinking, well, why did it work with the cur the brackets or or the parentheses and one didn't work? So in this instance, you're running a dot b, but you're actually running the function itself. You're invoking it, and it's returning back five. So that's why r now is becoming five. So if we do console dot log r r, you see r is undefined though, but it what it did, so let me repeat that. It's a little confusing. So the a dot b invokes this function. It doesn't return anything, but it console logs five. And that's why you see when you run this five. However, if you console log r itself, it didn't return anything from this function, so it becomes undefined. So that's the way it works. It's a little bit tricky. Um, but if you understand how this works, it's it's perfectly easy. So let me go over that one more time. If you do a dot b, returns your five. If you return a dot b, which is the function, but you haven't invoked it yet, and then you try to invoke it, you're going to get undefined because this dot length doesn't exist because you're just grabbing this right here. And then finally, if you return let r equals a dot b, it runs and invokes the function before it gets assigned. So this equals 5. But since it doesn't return anything, you still get undef you get um, do this. You get r is undefined because it never returned anything. So that is three really cool questions. I think the, they're pretty simple. They can be a little complicated running this debounce just coming off the top of your head. Is something you, a lot of people would have difficulty with unless you've really dealt with it. You might, I think you would probably get partial credit if you at least came up with a closure during it, um, like a pure function like this that accepts a function and returns it. I think that would give you partial credit. That's what I would do because I think that's a lot to ask of somebody. But I think this is great questions for people to learn. Now, there is a fourth one, which is create a pub sub in JavaScript. And this is a little bit more advanced, maybe intermediate to advanced. I'm not going to do this one with you. This is a take-home assignment for everyone watching. You know, try to do it yourself first. Think about how you would do it using a closure, and then uh, go ahead and Google it. There is some good examples out there, and if you like, copy and paste it into the description below and let me know how you solve that one. I'd love to hear everyone's uh, response. And I'll um, since for the true fans have watched all the way to the end, I'm going to give away a Udemy course of your. Uh, I think I could just gift it. Yeah on um, probably an advanced JavaScript course. If you already have it, tell me and I can get you a different one. I'll randomly choose one person from the comments below that um, either created this pub sub in JavaScript or created, um, told me about the interview problems. So yeah, just leave a message below and make sure you like and subscribe and we'll do that for you guys. So thank you, I appreciate you guys watching. I hope this was interesting. I hope you guys do really great in your interviews and take care.